Good morning. I'm Jackie Atchison, Executive Director of the Arts Council for Monterey County. Thank you for joining our Business Works workshop today. Business Works is one of our programs that helps solutions for the busy creative through quarterly informational workshops. For those of you joining us um, via Zoom, please use the chat below for any questions. And those on Facebook, please post your questions in the comments. Time permitting, we will try to answer them throughout the program as well as at the end. So today's workshop will be a discussion with other arts nonprofit leaders about the toll the pandemic has taken on the arts and their arts organizations. And while we wish we had the answers on how to rebuild, like you, we know we still have many questions. So I'd like to introduce today's guest. We have Colleen Bailey, Executive Director of the Monterey Jazz Festival. Nicola Riley, Executive Director of the Monterey Symphony. Juan Sanchez, Founder and Executive Director of Blanque Arts in Seaside. And Jeff Hendershide, the new Executive Director of Soul Treasures in King City. Thank you all for being here today. So I wanna start talking about um, the economic impact of this pandemic on the arts in our community. Um, we just had a, an economic impact report done and it's on our website if you wanna see it at artsformc.org. Um, and as you can expect, it's been devastating. 93% of the arts organizations in this county um, had a, saw a 93% reduction in revenue, earned revenue due to cancellation of programs, closure of venues, um, cancellation of, of events. We've also seen a 72.5% reduction in the workforce and 69% reduction in the economic output to the county. But we're confident that we can recover and we can rebuild a more resilient cultural sector, but it's gonna take time. And so we are gonna be looking out looking to our, our funders and supporters to help provide unrestricted funding for the near future to help restart the arts this year, next, years to come. So the first um, item we'd like to discuss is uh, scenario planning. Um, just if each of you could maybe talk a little bit how the pandemic has changed your organization, um, what you're looking at, um, you know, if, if you and your board have maybe discussed scenario planning and what your plans will be to re-engage your audience and, you know, are you gonna have indoor performances instead of outdoor performances, hybrid, in-person? Um, Colleen, do you wanna start on this? Sure. Well, obviously um, this has changed everything about what we do. So like everybody, you know, we um, immediately, uh, transitioned from a live event producer to a virtual event producer. And um, what I would say on the positive side is we've learned a lot and we've tried a lot of things. I think this has really forced all of us creative folks to really be um, masterful at reinvention and um, trying new things. So uh, one of the things that, that we've done during this time um, is actually look at who we partner with. Um, so, uh, you know, during the summer months last summer with all that was happening in the world, we decided to partner with NAACP and the Thurgood Marshall Fund um, to, to do some work um, to raise funds for them. So we used our festival last year as an opportunity to do that. And we raised significant money for, for some really important causes that were close, near and dear to our hearts. Um, we have developed a new partnership with CSUMB. We started building um, new um, curriculum around the Monterey Jazz Festival that's now being taught at CSUMB at the college level. Um, we partnered with YOSEL and with uh, Coomba Jazz up in Santa Cruz to do camps and, and other programs. So we're really trying to reach new audiences. And actually we've had um, real success at reaching a global audience. So um, our virtual festival this last year 
uh, reached 30,000 people from around the world. We had as many people from outside the United States as we did from inside the United States, which was really interesting. So it was a way to, to really um, broaden our reach. Um, we started some new merchandising programs. So we now have new collections that are developed around some of the artists that we work with. Um, and that's all available online so people can buy them anywhere in the world. Um, we have for the first time taken advantage of the archives that we have up at Stanford and have launched a new series, Evolution of Groove, which you can see behind me, um, and uh, have done some new programming with Christian Sands, who's our artist in residence. Um, who has done uh, basically an interview process called Welcome to the Sandsbox, where he's interviewed some wonderful artists, jazz artists, about the work that they do. Um, so all of that is brand new to us. And um, I think that's, that's been really creative. And as we think about scenario planning for the years to come, of course, we want to go back to doing our festival live and all of that. But I, I think these elements of what we've experimented with um, will be a component of what we do moving forward. And it's also helped us to, to develop some new revenue streams. So when so we're not as reliant on ticket sales as we were. Um, of course, um, we've lost 80% of our income because of ticket sales. So it's not to say we don't wanna go back to doing live events. Uh, we definitely do. It, I, I don't think the online solution um, is an answer long term to uh, to what we do. So, but it but it is a component, and I think an important component. Thank you. How about you, Juan? How has the pandemic changed your organization? So, so the pandemic um, really turned our 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 little organization that could upside down, in many ways and not. We probably serve you know some of the most vulnerable. Uh, population here in the peninsula. Just so you know, Palenque Arts does two things. We have educational program and we have a presenting program, right? Which is very ambitious for an organization that is barely starting, but uh, we really want to build community. And uh, the first thing that we that we did when the pandemic hit, it was we did a, a pretty much a needs assessment for our, our, our the, the, commu the, the community that we serve. And um, and so so we had to figure out, first of all, who, who could eat, <laughs> who was able to to have a, a place, a place to live and so on. So we we immediately saw that um, that many of these families did not have like the, the technology or the know how to go virtual. So we offer them training. We actually get, got them technology. We got them connected and trained. And we switched, you know, within like two weeks, we went virtual with all our classes. Um, and some of our teachers were more ready than others. <laughs> some were like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to do it. Others, I'm like, yeah, no, I tried it. Not my thing. And um, there's a, also kind of like there was a really sense of, of, of loss, right? Um, but we also have a, had the, the pandemic hit us in, you know, in very personal ways. Ten of our families uh, that I know of were impacted, including mine. I lost my father in December to, to COVID. And, um, you know, that sense of loss, um, it's, it's something that, that, that we had to cope with in, in different ways. And, and for us and for me, for me personally, was to not stop, continue doing the work because it made a difference, right? You know, the, the healing power of the arts was really evident from the beginning. And um, we decided also to, just like Colleen, just like reinvent ourselves. So we had so far eight virtual concerts that typically would be held here in this, uh, in this little, um, uh, girls locker room in uh, Martin, Luther, Martin Luther King School in, in Seaside where at, at most we would have 100 people. Well, guess what? You know, the, one of our latest uh, concerts was Aza Music from Morocco. We had 6,000 people and many of them from, from all over the place. Uh, we have Vietnamese music and we have, you know, so folks uh, a little bit like Colleen was saying have been discovering what, what we do and, and, and take an interest in, in, in us. We did not um, we had to lay off folks, but but um, we're we're proud to say that actually in terms of income level, even though we're not charging at the door, people have been very generous and um, and supported the work. Um, I in moving forward and and were you saying scenario planning, 
this is where where I think it's going to be really interesting because there's a there's a sense of uh, of being tired of the virtual uh, environment, and people are looking forward to to being in person. And we will have our first event May twenty second. We're going to have a, a just for donors, you know, 40, 40 people max with vaccines and all that stuff, and um, in, out in Karma Valley. I'm hoping that they won't rain. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, we, <clears throat> we're, we're moving on. Uh, our, our families really kind of, they, they ex they've gone through so much already that um, I think there would be, it, it would be really hard for us to, to find excuses to, to stop. You know, they, they're, they're showing the way, they're inspiring us. Great, thank you so much, Juan. Nicola, how about, how about you? So the Monterey Symphony, we are, you know, the very essence of what is not allowed. Um, 700 audience members inside with 80 people on the stage with 15 crew backstage um, and a staff and everyone running around and breathing the same air and trumpets and flutes spewing all of the things. So we were the first uh, to be told that's it, you're done. Uh, and it was actually within 48 hours of all of our musicians um, arriving here in Carmel and we had to cancel everything. Uh, we started scenario planning right then, right? What are we gonna do next? How are we gonna stay relevant? How are we gonna stay top of mind? Recognizing that the arts are a natural um, community, a natural gathering place, brings people together, people sharing a common experience being able to talk about it, uh, it's very powerful. Um, and music itself, I mean, everyone turned to listening to music all the time, listening to podcasts about music. I mean, music became the soundtrack truly to our lives because the silence of just our existence was deafening. Um, so we launched balcony sessions. We moved offices to downtown Carmel. We have a beautiful balcony here. We put together a film crew. We figured out how to record these pop-up recitals. We worked with our musicians, allowing them to do their own programming, playing what was important and meaningful to them, which gave us a much broader scope of the type of music that we normally perform. Um, we did an education series. Um, we appointed John Wineglass as our composer in residence, and he's written two pandemic-specific pieces, one which was filmed uh, in an empty sunset center, filmed from the back of the hall, so the, the backdrop was the 700 empty seats, um, working with a lighting designer and a film crew um, to really convey that sense of the feeling, just the, the emotional weight, um, the, the trauma, really, of what, of what we're all going through. And we actually just won our first film festival award um, from the Loge Cinema uh, Festival for that, for that piece, which we're really proud of. Um, we are getting ready to announce that we're going back to in-person um, and that we're going back inside. Um, but we're going to announce what we're doing in the spring before we tell anybody what we're doing in the fall, because guess what? We don't know yet. Um, and just this morning, I got the guidelines that San Francisco has um, for their arts group, and it is specific down to singers and flautists and French horn players and, and the, the specificity of those guidelines, the sensitivity to the arts in those guidelines, um, it gives me hope that we can do the same in Monterey County where we all really understand what we can do, what's safe to do. Um, and I think that, I know we're gonna talk about advocacy a little bit later, but how important it's going to be for us to come together and say, we need to have these so that we can start hiring artists again. I mean, we've kept our, our staff intact, but we want to be able to hire our entire symphony, our entire crew, our entire tech crew. We want to be able to bring those jobs and, and bring all of that back. So that's really top of mind for us right now. Thank you. Okay, Jeff, tell us how the pandemic's changed Soul Treasures and what your plans are for the future. All right. Well, first of all, I commend all my colleagues with um, for all these great outside the box ideas they've come up with and ways to just keep pushing. And it sounds like everybody's got that same determination in mind. We all recognize how important the arts are to our communities and to our children. And um, I just applaud you all for all your hard work and, and just doing what you can, you know. Um, so like many of the different arts organizations, we had to pivot immediately. 
Uh, we were actually in production for Frozen Junior when everything started to shut down and we had about 35 to 45 kids with crew. All they were rehearsed, dance, everything was choreographed. We were ready to move into the actual space. So the first thing we had to do was the damage control, you know, because like I believe one of you said, grief and loss. You know, this was a grieving process. When you lose um, your extracurricular activities, um, sports, you know, kids in sport, everything shut down. So the first thing we had to do is kind of develop a virtual, a little bit of like a, a, a band-aid for a moment to get these kids still being able to meet somehow and keep that camaraderie. So we immediately started trying to do like a sing-along every Friday for an hour. And then we tried to do, um, we have a board member here who took the reins and she's also a teacher and she started doing a drawing class. You know, we just started piecing together any type of artistic uh, meeting place virtually while we scrambled. Um, then like you, we, we went into a virtual, you know, how can we get programming out to the community and show people we're still here and that um, there's still a safe place for people to go to express themselves somehow artistically, um, which kind of pushed us towards um, in the summer, figuring out ways to kind of divide and conquer, right? Okay, we have this person who's really good with the music stuff. We need you to teach some music theory or put something together that that's, can program for that. I took on like an acting 101 series for six weeks just to get kids in there doing something the the sing-alongs were happening the the drawing was happening so we we started trying to find ways to um learn frantically learn the technical side of this world while we watched broadway to see what theater groups were going to do and stuff um one of the other things that really was helpful for us is we happened to have a little tiny itty bitty retail store and gallery attached to our site here in king city so the regulations that were coming from the health department and from the state were a little bit different depending on you know what pie you were in. So we were trying to balance, okay, can we, we had to shut down for a little while as everybody did, but then we were able to reopen at a small capacity. Was that even gonna be cost effective? Are we gonna be able to pay staff to be here to run a store where three people are gonna come in over the course of two weeks? So we had to meet with our board and decide where, what are we cutting? And I think one of the most interesting parts of the discussions that we had were balancing the impact of our mission versus the impact of what was desperately needed. So for example, we have a retail store that helps us stay open. We can stay open at 20% capacity. Okay, but does that meet our mission right now? Are we impacting the community by doing that? Or do we need to shift all of our attention and time to the programming side of things? So that became a little bit dicey, as you all know. And as you can see from this outstanding report um, about the economic loss, everybody felt it at once. And the big question was, how can we stay safe? Now, what we were able to pivot and finally do was use our backyard. We have this big, beautiful property um, so we're very, very fortunate. Again, unlike many others, we weren't allowed to go back into the Robert Stanton Theater. It's connected to King City High School. And obviously, like many of you, that's just not happening. Can't, we couldn't even get on the stage. It actually, we went in there to get some of our equipment out and it became quite an issue um, because people found out that we had got our stuff and, and other people wanted to get in there. So it became a little dicey there, but um, we built a theater <laughs> in our backyard. We put up these boards and we put up these signs and we drilled them to, to stake posts into the fence. And we bought some new sound equipment and just set it up outside by our shed and put a cover over it. And we got 11 kids back there socially distant to where they weren't touching. And we taught them some choreography and we gave them some music and we did a children's showcase in the backyard where parents felt safe enough. You know, we had to meet with the police department multiple times. We had to meet with the, the city officials and make sure that we were following. Do we understand this correctly, right? We tried throwing together some backyard concerts last summer 
where a singer songwriter would come and set up and they would be distant from everyone else and people would have their little family units, a couple chairs here, a couple chairs there. At first, of course, people were not feeling safe enough. They were like, oh, they're trying to do something there and I see it, but we're gonna wait and see how that pans out. But slowly but surely, um, I think Juan said it best, people are extremely generous. They do understand that we are all being hit right now. So what we learned was the more we tried to use the backyard for events and for, you know, we tried to put tables up and have kids come and do paintings on Saturdays and nobody could touch each other. You can't go near one another. Everyone has to be masked up and stuff, but just the camaraderie of being with other people who are like-minded and expressing themselves is really what's been what helping us start to gain some traction. So going forward into the future, we're really still not sure. You know, the fall is unknown. Like Nicola was saying, you, the regulations are changing daily. Um, sure. Could we, would we love to do a children's musical in the fall? Who wouldn't? Would you guys love to do a concert? Of course, but we don't know. And it's really hard to convince um, a group of people to put all of their time and energy into something that might just disappear on a dime. So I think what we're going to do is a hybrid. You know, we talked about expanding, not replacing, you know, things are going to go back to normal eventually, hopefully. And what we need to do is keep the things that we've learned that we were able to put together. Um, some of those things that my colleagues were talking about, virtual concerts and, and balcony um, uh, performances and these things that were just so beautiful and outside the box. I think that there is some room to keep some of those things even when we can go back to our normal programming. So that's kind of the, the sense of hope that we're taking as we move into the future. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I have to say I'm impressed with all of you and your organizations on how quickly you adapted to um, the situation we were in, you know, I think as Colleen said, creatives will always find a way to create. And, you know, we became, uh, we, we provided more services virtually than we had ever planned for or thought would ever happen. And everybody just did an amazing job. I felt like there was no lapse of art in our community. So again, thank you for that. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about the future and the demand for services and how you plan to re-engage audiences for in-person events. Um, do you think people were gonna feel comfortable attending um, an indoor or an outdoor event coming up in the fall, I would think. So, so Juan, do you wanna start talking about that? What you think will happen with planking? Sure. Um, like I said, we, 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 kind of, we are like a two-headed monster in the sense that our educational piece is really uh, the biggest chunk of both the work that we do, but we also, we are really proud of, of the work that our, our presenting season, you know, has, has produced the, the, the type of events. So um, a little bit like Jeff was saying, we're, we're, we're going to be uh, flexible and nimble uh, moving, moving forward. Our, our board is very, very conscious of, uh, you know, issues that, that, that can come up with um, not complying or just trying to take necessary risks. So we're, we're going to keep it safe as, as much as we can. And, and we have, have actually started last week, we started working with kids outside and we had um, our, our jazz class met there, our ballet folklorico, our hip hop dance. Uh, I had my little six singers, you know, and the sense of joy kind of like of being around one another, even with masks and, and distance and, and, and uh, or you have to check in. It's like, yeah, contact tracing. We have to do all these things, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's, that's, um, that's bringing a, a sense of kind of relief that, that there's like an in-between place. The other piece, of course, is vaccinations, right? Uh, a lot of folks, especially, um, you know, we, we all talk in first person. I, I really felt that our way forward, and, and, and I'm a firm believer in that, and if you follow my social media feed, it's like I'm putting vaccine <laughs> advocacy out there because I really want normalcy back. We want to feel some, you know, a sense of normalcy. And um, I'm proud to say that through our partnerships with the Boys and Girls Club, the uh, VNA and CPY, we managed to get uh, uh, vaccine appointments for all our teachers. Um, and not only that, um, 
as I'm talking to the city of Seaside and to a councilman uh, wizard and councilman Garcia Razola, they tell me, you know what, we, we're having other clinics here. How, you know, in La a lot of Latinx folks are not really buying into vaccines. I'm like, oh, I, I, I can help. So I, I spread the word and we got 25 of our families, um, you know, vaccinated through a VNA um, and also through, you know, the city of Seaside and uh, the fire department. I got to give him props, you know, um, uh, Chief um, Garcia. So for me, it's it's really uh, those pieces that are the, the safety first that are going to allow us to start thinking more broadly. Will we have immediately in this little teeny tiny place that only fits 100 people <laughs> social distance or whatever you know we're still sharing air and and even with the, the air filters uh who's gonna feel comfortable being here perhaps 20 people you know perhaps 25 uh will feel comfortable but like uh jeff was saying the, the likelihood is that we will have also hybrid events we we um we have been very fortunate to build uh, also kind of a technical team on the side and, you know, uh, Erica Wobbles uh, and here now Monterey, they've, they helped us produce high quality events with a great sound and, you know, that have been seen by thousands. And um, I think the total, I mean, the, the total impact of, for example, are, are, are with Mr. Paul on Fridays. We have a free class on Facebook has been seeing every every week by 400 people. And he's done already wow. 50 of them. <laughs> I mean, the impact is is huge. Of course, when we're doing here, he, he would have 18 to 20 kids. So this hybrid model is gonna continue forward for, for Hollywood Minute, I think. And, um, and we have to continue being nimble. Um, we are hoping that we can have our, you know, our festival back this year in some reduced format. I think I'm going to pick Jeff's uh, brain about how to do that kind of stuff safely. Um, and because I, I think for us, it's most, most importantly to serve our families, but um, eventually also to let others know that, that, that the arts are, are back, baby, but, but, <laughs> but, but in a, in a, in a good way, right? It's like, um, it's a, uh, the techs also are really suffering, you know, people that are, I mean, I'm sure that Nicola, you, <laughs> those, those folks, right. Are, are really struggling. Those 50 people backstage. Right. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we can, we can have some sense of, uh, you know, modified normalcy real soon. Thank you. Nicola, let's move on to you. How, how do you think you're going to re-engage your audience and will people feel comfortable coming back to the symphony an indoor symphony or do you have plans to you know do a hybrid also well let's see it's uh 10 28 a.m on april 23rd and as of this moment i feel okay about it i think that um we're gonna make a big announcement about going back into sunset center in 2022 in uh, beginning of 22 um we of course need to finish our music director search we have four finalists um, who we interviewed back in 2019 um, and have kept moving that along through the pandemic and, and keeping them engaged and keeping our audiences engaged. Um, again, I, I totally agree with Juan about the, the vaccines. And when you look at the data that's being collected at the national level, the statewide level, you see that people's desire to attend events again goes up when they know everyone's vaccinated around them. And some of, you know, a lot of the guidelines that we're seeing around gatherings are, okay, you can have this many people who don't show proof of vaccine, but you can have this many people and it's so much more if everyone shows proof of vaccine. Um, I think that people miss being together. I think even the most introverted of us um, like those random connections um that you have just the other day i was at trader joe's and someone let me cut in line and said i'm gonna let this young lady go ahead of me and i went thank you for calling me a young lady because i just got mammed at the post office and you made my day and i met two masked people over frozen meatballs had this random conversation we didn't exchange names or any of that it was just you know, oh, I've never tried that cornbread mix. Do you like it? Oh, I do. It has corn chunks in it. It's really, but those reminders that we're human beings, that that most of us are essentially very kind, 
people, we are missing all of that. As much as we love our families and whoever we happen to live with, to, to be living with, we love them. But those sort of random interactions or seeing people um, from your past and having this lovely moment. I was so excited to see Jeff on this Zoom. He and I were in Evita, um, which was one of the last live shows that I got to play. I was in the pit. He, of course, was Peron on stage. And just seeing him reminded me of that joy, of that feeling, of that, that connectivity, that community, that artistic spirit. And I think, um, I think audiences are missing that. I think our board members are missing that. I think our performers are missing that connection, validation, um, that feeling. You know, we all, you don't work in the arts because you want to become a millionaire and you, know, you want to have a fancy house where everything in it works all the time, right? Like that is not why you go into the arts. You're like, I want to learn how to fix my own toaster. Um, and by the way, my, you know, my kids have been sitting backstage since they were two so that I can work and go to these shows. We go into the arts because we love it and we can't imagine our lives without it. I can't imagine my life without music. So when I think about how much it means to me, and why I go to the office every day and why I sit through so many meetings and so many Zoom calls, it's because it's ultimately, I just care about it so much. And I know that our supporters and our community, we feel the same way. Um, and, and so I think when they feel safe and it's gonna have, it's not a buy, it's not an on off. It's not a binary dark light. It's not, it's gonna be this gradual coming back as people, start to feel comfortable. I had a cup of coffee inside the other day and I kept looking around like, is this, is this okay? It was okay. <laughs> it was okay. I had coffee. It was nice. I wasn't freezing in Carmel. It was great. So as we like start to get back into that and then people will be reminded, you know, you see, you're hearing people laugh again in public. You're hearing people wave to each other. There was a period where we all walked heads down, you know, just ignoring everything and we're, we're, we're lifting up a little bit. So I think we're going to see that play out in our organization, but it's going to take time. Thank you. Jeff, how about you? I mean, you have been pretty, you know, keeping your audience engaged with the outdoor activities. Um, do you think you'll be able to increase it? Do you think you'll be able to have um, bigger audiences? In the near yeah, future? Um, I do. I, I... Like, like Nicola, I feel hopeful right now. Um, we could do a three hour session on the challenges we've all faced and how hard things have been and probably not even scratch the surface because we all have just felt that. But what I'm really loving hearing is how many outside the box ideas there are because like Nicola said, it's about the passion for the arts. It, when it's just your job, it's different. But when you know the impact of that content in the world, you find something inside yourself and amongst your idea makers and things start to happen. And so for us, what's really been beneficial, and I think it sounds like a lot of you have also done this, is our collaborations with other groups. So we contracted out with Chispa, and it's one of our most successful things we've done. We do what's called art in a bag where we have a couple volunteers that come in and they're in mass and we have tables and we have individual bags and we put the materials for an art project in, in a 150, 200 bags with the instructions on how to do it. And then we take those to um, these low income family housing sites and every child gets these. So the arts were being delivered to them so they can take a project out of a bag while they're sitting at home doing distance learning and have something to do with their hands, to work on with their families. And that has been something that was that has been wildly successful. And the gratitude that's come back from that has been really positive. So we will not stop doing that for sure. So that's one of those hybrid things where we didn't do it before it was developed by our previous ED and our program manager, and it has been successful and it's been impactful. So we'll keep doing stuff like that. We recently, um, I've, I recently developed a contract working with the Sun Street Centers, the recovery community. 
and developing some exclusive content for those people who, you know, a lot of times in their daily programming, it's sitting around talking about how sad things have been in the past or how hard things are, giving them a couple hours a few times a week to come and just express themselves artistically with not, without opening it up to the public or to the children, just, just singling in on the recovery community and trying to develop a healthier society through the arts in that way has been really beneficial. And I think we'll continue doing stuff like that. Um, we're gonna be working with CSUMB to try to help the disenfranchised and like the, the underserved community here in South County have their own graduation ceremony uh, through our collaboration with the Salinas Valley Fairgrounds. Um, we're doing a drive-in concert uh, with the Salinas Valley Fairgrounds, which, as many of you know, is largely inspired by PAC Rep's work over with Monterey County or with the Monterey Fairgrounds. They developed a way to get people safely on a stage with their own microphones and being, bring people in in their vehicles using an FM transmitter to where they get access to music and the arts and they feel safe enough to go out and do that. So we're, we're going to keep trudging along with that. Um, Juan was saying that they've uh, developed a nice technical team. I know that Nicola was saying the same, and we've all kind of had to do this virtual, uh, you know, the hardest part about virtual stuff is if that's not your wheelhouse, it's basically you're, you're taking these slow baby steps to just learn how to do it. So we're really excited to have some good team members who know tech stuff. Uh, Tom Mooneyham, who many people know, who worked with MCOE for years, he's a technical genius. And so having people who their passion is that connectivity, getting people connected through a virtual means. So we're going to keep latching onto that. But ultimately, the collaborations with other groups, I look forward to supporting each of you in your future endeavors and seeing what it is that you guys come up with and finding a way that we can take our what we have and throw it behind your group. You know, I would really love to collaborate with other groups as we go into the future so that we say, hey, this worked for me. What's worked for you? And start, like Juan said, let's pick each other's brains and, and going forward when we do this hybrid, we'll have a collaboration uh -huh. where we can do virtual stuff. But also as soon as we have the, the, the ability, start getting kids together again, start getting families together again. And I will be looking forward to the day that we can be inside of some sort of music, auditoriums, theater, and sitting inside together with everyone feeling safe to watch some art. Thank you. So Colleen, how about you? You have a big festival in September. What are your plans for this year? Well, as you can imagine, um, it's particularly challenging when you have 30,000 people in a fairgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're dealing with. So very, very large scale uh, event. And um, if you haven't been to the festival before, when you're in the arena, particularly, um, you're right up against each other. Um, so we, we pack people in pretty closely in normal years. So that, that does um, create some challenge. The other thing is, and, and I think Nicola, you probably experienced this as well, um, our audience has earned their seats over time. And we have some audience members who have been there for 40 years. And each year they try to get an upgrade until they can get into those front area seats. And that's taken them 40 years to get up to that particular seat. Um, so, you know, we're looking at the regulations um, that are coming out. Now, the, the thing is, and you've all mentioned this, that the regulations are changing on a weekly basis. And so, you know, we're having to scenario plan on a weekly basis. I, I've been in two scenario planning meetings just this morning um, to, to think about what we can do and, and then to pencil it out. Um, so, uh, you know, looking at, um, you know, if we have to have six foot, so, so what we know right now is potentially it's still six feet distance that you can have as many as six people in a pod from a maximum of three family units, right? So looking at that, then we've also, so we've had architects create CAD drawings around that to show us what the maximum capacity is in that scenario. Then what would be the maximum capacity if we had three feet um, distance? Under the same scenario, there are serious food and beverage um, standards. 
So in, in the yellow tier standard that came out, food and beverage had to be delivered to your seat. Um, so you can't wander the midway section, it can't happen. Um, so when you look at the revenue streams for the festival, all of those pieces are, are very important to the overall revenue and to the experience. People love to be able to move from one space to another to explore different kinds of music, um, to visit with their with the community that comes around um, this. That's such a big part, just the people watching. Um, you know, we have really unique vendors who bring incredible art and food and from all over. Um, and it creates the, the experience. Um, and so the other thing is around bringing kids, because we usually bring in students from across the country. Um, right now, you can't bring students from outside of California. Um, you can, they have to be with their parents. So uh, there are just so many rules and regulations. So we're, we have not settled on anything yet. Um, I know what the capacity is for six foot. We just got that in last night and for three foot in the arena. Um, so we're budgeting now, okay, what can we do artistically that, that you know, will somehow pencil out? Um, so it, it's gonna be a different experience. What we have done in the meantime is we've surveyed our audience to say, will you come? Are you gonna feel comfortable coming? And they are comfortable coming to an outdoor only experience. And luckily the fairgrounds does provide us with our largest venues outside. So that's the good news. 67% said that they would love to come to the festival, but 65% said they want us to follow all of the safety protocols, right? Which, you, you know, I, I totally understand. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that's, that's come up for us is a question around um, you know, vaccine validation. So right now the state of California requires events of our size um, to um, have everybody show us that they've been vaccinated. So we have to look at their cards and that is a civil liberties issue with some people. Um, and so then you can alternatively do on-site testing, um, which again, when you're dealing with 30,000 people is kind of, um, <laughs> potentially nightmarish in terms yeah, yeah. of just the logistics and the timing and all of that. So there's a lot to be considered in this. Um, we knew when all of this happened that um, that events like ours were um, were going to be the last ones to come to come on board um, in in their traditional format. So, um, you know, we've also obviously looked at, you know, do we live stream? Do we do we record and then do some kind of a virtual element um, so that we can make sure that those people who want to engage with us have the opportunity to engage with us, um, even if our capacity is severely limited. Um, so I think there is demand. I think people are hungry for live experiences. Uh, there's no question that's what they're telling us. Um, they are, they want to be safe. And so it's up to us to make sure that, that we're following all those guidelines. And one of the other things that I've learned um, recently is the recommendations that have come out are actually fine. They'll fine you if you don't follow the recommendations. So they really are requirements. And there's a lot of things in there about even security, for example. They don't want security people to be exposed, um, you know, to the virus. So how do you go through security? How do you um, keep the musicians safe behind the stage as well as on the stage? Obviously, the, the unions have their own um, requirements. Um, so there are a lot of considerations, uh, food and beverage, even for the artist hospitality, you know, it can't be delivered in the same way. Everything has to be pre-wrapped. So there are just so many details that, um, that have to be worked through um, and considered. So, um, so we haven't, we're not announcing yet. A lot of our colleagues are announcing, but they're keeping it rather vague um, about what it's going to look like. Um, so, um, you know, we don't want to be quite as vague as that because we feel like people ought to know it's going to be a different experience, whatever the scenario. And we want people to know what they're what they're buying and, and feel good about that and know that we're taking into account um, everybody's health and safety as as a first priority, as I know all of you are so. Right. 
And then of course, the, the, the other thing that's important to know is just that the county, right, can regulate what happens in the county. So even if the governor opens up the state of California, that doesn't mean that events are gonna be allowed here in Monterey County. Um, and the county wants to, it's being very conservative and wants to make sure that the state is opened um, to big events, that other counties have had success at running these events and that, that we're following similar protocols. So, um, so it's gonna be you know, a while before we probably know that. Right, thanks Colleen. Uh -huh. So one of the roles of the Arts Council is to be out there advocating for the arts and for arts ed education. And this past week I've been meeting with all our representatives for, in the state legislature for, for Monterey County, um, requesting, and with our county supervisors, requesting an increase in funding. Um, California only invests about 73 cents per capita into the arts. And so we are asking for them to increase it to a dollar. Um, you know, we're probably the lowest in the country and we're supposed to be the creative state. So we're, we're hoping that um, they get the message. And I'm just wondering if, if all of you are also advocating on behalf of your organizations. Are you meeting with people? Um, you know, and, and then how can we all collaborate together to educate the legislators and our community that the arts are essential? Which I really think we've seen a lot of that this year that people are starting to get it. So uh, Nicola, do you wanna talk about that a little bit? Sure, I, I'd be happy to. I mean, if you think about how many times you've had to explain to somebody why the arts are important um, to a funder, to a donor, to a, Wait, you're the executive director? Does that mean you're like on the podium? What does that mean? What is what do you do? What do you do in the morning? What do you do when you get out of bed? All these questions. It's now that tenfold, right? It's you're doing that over and over and over again. Um, and I sit on a statewide board, the Association of California Symphony Orchestras Board AXO. Um, it's a 50-year-old service organization that was actually started here in Monterey. Um, and it was uh, the League of American Orchestras represents orchestras throughout the country. And there was a league conference here and a bunch of Californians, um, as Californians like to do, went, why don't we have our own thing? Um, so they started this and AXO is a service organization, um, but it's an advocacy organization and they're advocating at the statewide level um, for guidelines, for funding. Um, I have been on so many webinars. Um, there are some incredible people who work um, for Californians for the arts. There are some incredible people who are working at the statewide level. Um, I think Julie Baker is one of my personal heroes. Um, she just gets everybody fired up about how important it is. And it's going to be so essential that we have these guidelines. And it's going to be so essential that our voices are really loud at the county level, because exactly to Colleen's point, to everyone's point, you know, June 15th is this magical date now where all the tears disappear. But that doesn't mean the guidelines go away. That doesn't mean that at all. It just means we don't know if we're yellow or red or orange or purple or blue or green or chartreuse. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything else. And I just, you know, thinking about like our collective mental health that was literally one week where on Monday we got a set of guidelines. On Tuesday, the governor announced that June 15th, the world changes. And on Friday, we got another set of guidelines. And I was like, that's it. I'm putting my computer in the dishwasher because I can't keep reading and keep trying to understand and keep churning. I mean, you just listen to Colleen, you know, rattle off about three feet and six feet and pause and that's what's in our brain all the time. And then you change the integers and then it's another equation and then we're all trying to figure it out. So it's gonna be so important when this magical unicorn June 15th date comes where something will descend from the sky or maybe the Phoenix behind Juan will animate itself and become alive. And, but there will be such, it'll be so important for our voices to be so loud about, okay, this is what we can do. Now, this is what we're gonna try and do. Now we need Monterey County to say, this is what you're allowed to do. And there needs to be some uniformity. There needs to be some parity. There was a lot of advocacy about six months ago about parity 
between arts organizations and religious organizations. Explain to me why a church can gather for a service and have singing, but we can't. How is that different? So I think it's going to be so important for our voices to be as loud and as passionate and as committed as they can be at the county level, because that's where we're really going to get the green light um, to do anything. And, and I have to say, one of the best things that AXO has done is whenever an announcement comes out at the statewide level, they take that information they sort of translate it and then send it out to their membership. So I know we are all so zoomed out, so webinared out. We're just, we're so tired of looking at our own foreheads. Um, <laughs> it's so tired of my forehead. I'm like, I've never spent this much time looking at my forehead. Um, but make sure you sign up for the Californians for the Arts and, and emails from Mary Adams. And you're just aware of it because it's literally gonna be the sort of make or break of, of how we get to do this. Um, and as, as executive directors, we're problem solvers, right? Like that's literally the essence of, of who we are. And every day there's a new set of information about how to solve those problems. So it's just gonna be so important for us to keep amplifying and keep saying how important it is. We need actual guidelines that we can actually follow and that are actually real and are not going to change 24 hours after you send them. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, we've discussed this before about um, funders no longer prioritizing the arts. We saw that happen quite a bit this last year, um, while others have stepped up in very generous ways with converting program uh, support into um, operating support. We had a couple of funders do that this year. We actually had a very large funder of the arts for Monterey County step out of Monterey County this past year, which was really disappointing. So in the end, how, how do you think it'll balance out? You know, Colleen, do you wanna speak to that? Well, I, I think this year we've been lucky with PPP loans. I think a lot of us have, have really benefited from that. And NEVA now has worked on a um, SVGO grant, which is um, for those of us who work in venues and are on the perform in the performing arts can apply to that. And it just, we heard that it opens up on Saturday and okay. that could be a significant funding. Um, and that's closed the gap in the, while we've lost some of these funders, um, but that won't last that kind of government funding isn't going to last. And, and so I'm hoping that, um, you know, with that, that uh, the, the joy and that people are going to experience as they come back to the arts and understanding the sense of um, community that only the arts really provides, um, that that's going to uh, inspire them to give to the arts in a new way. But I, I think it is absolutely the holden of all of us to be making sure that we make that compelling case um, that, that people don't forget. We tend to be such good problem solvers that sometimes um, we make it look so great on the outside that people don't recognize what's happening on the back side of things. Um, and that we're, you know, we're fixing things with duct tape. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, piecemealing it together and how many artists do you know are working for free or or for way under market rate um, and barely hanging on financially and I think we need to be voices for them to make sure people understand what it takes to do to do this really important work that helps us envision what life can be in the future and, um, and and give us some kind of a goal. Um, it's amazing what you can what you can live through when your spirit is uh, lifted. And I think that's what arts do. Absolutely. Well, we're almost running out of time here. So I just wanted to give everybody a chance for a last word, talk about um, any events you have coming on, uh, coming in the future, um, anything else you wanna mention. And Jeff, what's going on with Soul Church? Oh. Sorry, Juan, did you want to say something? Oh, it's okay. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> um, well, first of all, again, thank you for having us. Um, and thank you to all of these wonderful people that are out there just doing the problem solving. Nicola, I agree with you. It is so good to see your face. And I, I think you guys all made some great points about people want to be out with other people. It's been a long time. 
And they, like Colleen said, they don't realize how many things the arts actually encompass, you know, whether it's a concert or a virtual drawing class or standing there and listening to music and painting a canvas, they don't realize that interaction, it all draws back and comes to the art. So um, I just wanted to touch on something with the, the philanthropic side. One of the things that we've noticed, and I think you all mentioned, is that while there has been some generous grantors that stepped up and recognized that, hey, wait a minute, how are they surviving right now? Let us help. Um, one of the biggest um, things that I've noticed is the, the general population, our citizens in our community, are so generous. If you give them an opportunity and you put something out there to them and show them, hey, this is where we're at and we're, we're, we're hurting a little bit for this, that, and the other, they rise to the occasion every time. And I really, I can't say enough good things about our South County community helping Soul Treasures out in this time. They have really stepped up multiple times to, to kick in, whether it's like an auction, a silent auction on Facebook, or we get some material that they can just latch onto, the generosity is just coming. So I, I applaud them to anybody watching. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Um, going forward, Soul Treasures, um, again, we're trying to think outside the box with this little production studio. We have some cameras, some lighting stuff, some music, um, some Bose towers, and we're trying to utilize that production side of things to take it out into the community in a safe way. Um, so we're doing this drive-in concert um, we did one back in February, a Valentine's Day concert, where we had one of our artists with a keyboard on a stage, lit, camera, and then sound coming out, and people were able to drive right in, sit there, and listen to her sing and play piano for the evening. It was a wonderful little date night. We added some chocolates and roses for them, nice. so they can, you know, have like a little two-person date night in their car. So we took that idea and went, well, let's do that again. And then watching Pack Rep again be successful over at the Monterey Fairgrounds, we kind of tried to throw something together in South County. So we have a Disney concert coming up on May 13th. Normally the South County shuts down during fair time, you know, FFA and the 4-H groups and stuff and the, the big beautiful barns and all those groups with these kids that raise animals and stuff. Um, they're still trying to work their situation out. Well, normally they would have a kid's night at the fair. So we are going to do a drive-in uh, little Disney concert where a couple of our artists in this area are going to get up and just sing some fun songs and families can come and, and check that out. And um, going forward, we're going to try to do more showcases in our backyard. We're developing programming with uh, the Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA. Uh, we're trying to just get out there and help other organizations. And one thing that I know we all kind of see is that the more we collaborate and work together, the stronger we are. I mean, we have tons of great ideas, Absolutely. but like Nicola said, it's not some magic unicorn that we don't know what color tier we're going to be in. The reality is, is we need to take that idea and then figure out how to make it work. And we can do that together. So going forward, I am here for you guys. Anything that we can do from down here, or I will drive to you, whatever you need. I would love to collaborate and, and work with you guys going forward while we figure it out. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Juan, what's what's going on with Planky Arts in the near future? Yeah, so so we are, like I said, we're we're back in, in person, you know, for, for our classes and our events. We are actually right now <clears throat> we have a, a donor event on April uh, on May 22nd at, at the Corkscrew in, in Karma Valley but I, I wanted to speak to uh, just briefly about the issue of you know our you know how do we 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 claim in the importance of the arts and and uh, honestly we we have been uh, our, our community has been devastated personally by 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 COVID in so many different ways that we actually became a pass through agency for for immediate relief, which was a big stretch for us. And um, and we got a, a, a COVID relief grant from Community Foundation. Um, <clears throat> moving forward, though, I think it's really, really important that I mean, we we. I, I'm going to put something on the table. We have an issue of inequity, right? Of, of resources in our community. Uh, the, the resources in Carmel do not compare to the, the ones in here in Seaside, right? So, so we're like, uh, for us, um, we cannot just have a, a, a little cof, you know, coffee time with, with, a, with a donor and can write a $200,000 check. It's not going to happen. So for us, the, the, that conversation 
is just really, 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 really difficult um, in, in order for us to survive. We also have to really expand the definition of what is the impact of the arts. You know, for us is, uh, you know, the healing part, the connecting part, the community building part. Um, we just had a wonderful uh, Art Against Bullying uh, session. And, and, and uh, sadly, we, we're dealing with kids who are so messed up by you know their mental health that they're they're doing really serious things and so we need to kind of perhaps think outside the box and and, and claim um and, and try to reach other other aspects and, and equity for me it's it's a it's a big one and you know um how to maintain you know this 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 connection with the arts for 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 communities that that typically do not have access to it so kudos to the arts council for all the work that you do too Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Colleen? Well, we just closed out our auditions for the Next Generation Jazz Orchestra, who's getting an, the wonderful opportunity to work with uh, Gerald Clayton, who we just adore at the Monterey Jazz Festival. Um, and we are in, in the midst of auditioning for the Next Generation Women in Jazz um, combo. And so anybody who's interested in auditioning for that, auditions are open and they're online. And um, we are uh, launching this new camp, as I said, um, when we started this program today with Yosel and with um, Kwumba Jazz, and um, people can register for that um, now. And um, it's, we're calling it Kojak, C-O-J-A-C. Um, and um, it's got both an orchestral and a jazz component to it. And there are about uh, 35 musicians from around the world who are involved in this. Um, phenomenal musicians. Um, so uh, really, um, I'm so excited by what this could be for the, for the community. And um, so I'm hoping that students who may be orchestral students who um, participate in that might get to learn a little bit about jazz and vice versa, and that we see ourselves as a music community and stop pigeonholing you know, people, especially young people into these, you know, these groups. Um, and, and so they can learn all about music and self-expression. So that's what we're up to right now. And obviously planning for the festival and I'm hoping to have um, something out to the community about that in May. Great. Thanks, Colleen. Nicola, how about you with the symphony? Yeah, so we just released our um, four part series, uh, open source education content, uh, learning um, about different themes and composers and music. Um, it all has accompanying uh, materials for kids and parents to download or we can send those uh, to anybody. In a normal year, we bring about 10,000 kids to come and hear the Monterey Symphony as a field trip. Um, and of course we can't do that. So we're uh, working with our partner schools um, on that again, and at our at the height, we were serving kids from four different counties: um, Monterey, San Benito, Santa Clara, and Santa Cruz County. Um, and of course, that's all changed. We've got our final two balcony sessions: one in May, one in June. Um, on May fifteenth, um, we'll be making our big announcement about what our plan is uh, for next season, rolling out that communications plan, um, and we're getting ready to hire some people. So we're going to have some. <laughs> jobs open in the art with dental insurance. So check out our <laughs> website. That's great. <laughs> Super pumped about that. And uh, dental vision health. It's like, it's, it's a, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. That's um, great. Anyway, but just really happy to be here um, today with, with my colleagues. It's always a great reminder that we're not alone in this. Um, and I would say, you know, my, my door is always open. I'm always happy to have a phone chat or get an email or anything as a check-in or a question or a, we've got to, you know, we've got to be there for each other. It's really important. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. And just a little update on the Arts Council. On May 6th, we have our 16th annual Champions of the Arts. It's virtual, first time, hopefully last time, um, but we hope you'll be there at 6 p.m. And I want to thank you all for being here. Jeff, Nicola, Colleen, Juan, thank you so much. If you'd like to know more about them, we do have their biographies on our website at arts for the number four, MC for Monterey County dot org. And thank you all and have a great weekend. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you everyone. Good to see you.
Good to see you, Colleen. Talk soon. Thank you.